I know I'm going to have fun today, and I hope you have a little bit of fun as well. So top 10 tips for optimizing your photos in Lightroom. How many of you are already using Lightroom and already feel that all your photos are just totally perfect? You're just here for the free candy. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about, you know, sort of broadly, 10 tips. How do I, you know, narrow things down to just 10 tips? It's easy. You make 10 tips, and then you put all sorts of mini tips sprinkled in between. So there will be lots of uh, kind of random things we'll talk about. If you're just getting started with Lightroom, then I encourage you to take a look at uh, my Gray Learning website. You can learn about the videos that I've got available. It goes into a lot more detail than I could possibly cover in just uh, a couple hours here at the B&H Photo Event Space. So let's dive right in. Simple enough, start with the basics. And in the context of the develop module, what I really mean when it comes to the basics is literally the basic adjustments. And what I find that a lot of photographers have a tendency of doing is sort of getting the cart before the horse, as it were. Just, they want to dive in and add film grain to their photos. No, not really, not so far. Anybody, film grain, no? Yeah, it's so like 1982, right? Yeah. Uh, adding a vignette, adding creative effects, split toning, going right to black and white. And I actually encourage, even if you have a pretty good feeling that you might take a photo to black and white, we'll talk more about that a little bit later, that you really start with the basic adjustments. And to me, this sort of falls into two basic categories, no pun intended. One is the color adjustments, and the other is the tonal adjustments, the overall exposure, brightness, contrast, these sorts of things. And the color, I think, is where most photographers struggle. The first thing I'll point out, how many of you are shooting raw just about all the time? How many, actually, let's reverse that. How many of you never shoot raw? Not a, oh, wait, one, two hands. Only shooting JPEG? So a couple, two out of this whole crowded room of people. When you're shooting raw, you don't have to worry about the color temperature. I think of the color temperature setting in the camera really as just a convenience setting. It might save you a little bit of work in post-processing, at least in theory. For me personally, it won't save me any bit of effort at all, really, because I'm going to touch the temperature and tint sliders regardless. I'm that much of a control freak. So whether I have to move a slider just a little bit or a lot, it's really not that much of a difference. And so I leave my camera almost always, there's a few exceptions, but I leave my camera almost always set to the automatic white balance. I find that my camera does a reasonably good job under most circumstances. Mixed lighting can be a little bit of a challenge. But even still, with a raw capture, there's no penalty for making that change in Lightroom's develop module when we're talking about those temperature and tint adjustments. If you're shooting JPEG or TIFF or some other file format where everything is kind of baked in, now you do need to be concerned about color temperature, so you'll want to be a little bit more careful in the capture. But when we're talking about raw captures in the context of Lightroom's develop module, we don't have to worry about the accuracy of that color, again, other than just the convenience of having it as close to perfect as possible right out of the camera. And so you'll notice that I have an option here. I can choose one of those presets. So if I neglected to set the color temperature preset to something that might work really well in the camera, I can essentially accomplish the exact same thing after the capture. So here's what it would have looked like if I had the camera set to, uh, in this case, fluorescent, or tungsten, or cloudy. Ooh, there's some tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've got all sorts of options, but I leave this set always to as shot. A quick little side note, this doesn't count as one of the 10 tips, or even the bonus tips. This is just bonus, bonus. The auto option here does not relate to the auto setting in your camera. It's not the same as setting the camera to auto. So it's not like, oh, let me pretend like I had the camera set to auto. This is Lightroom auto. If you choose as shot, then it's whatever the camera had established. If you choose auto here, it's Lightroom evaluating the image and trying to decide what those settings ought to be. And I'd say about half the time it does pretty good, and the other half the time I find it does pretty awful. Uh, and so I don't usually bother with that. So when it comes to color adjustment, one of the concepts you might be a little bit familiar with, or at least you are familiar with, even though you might not necessarily know it by name, that is memory colors. We just intuitively know the colors of certain things, not necessarily everything. And some of us might know certain things better than other things. But there's this concept of memory colors where we know what the red of a, a ripe red tomato is. And we know what the yellow is of a ripe banana and the green of a not ripe banana. And as long as we're within sort of a narrow range of tolerance, we've got a little bit of flexibility. But when it comes to memory colors, objects that sort of have a 
a correct color, you might say, then we need to be a little bit more accurate. And so if, for example, I say, you know, it was you know, late afternoon light, it was really beautiful, and uh, you know, the, the light was just really glowing with heat, you might say, very incandescent that light was, this is really what it looked like, how many of you are going to believe that? I figured there would be one, just like on a lark, but no, nobody's going to believe that because it's way beyond what might be possible for what we believe tomatoes to look like. So when we have an object, in this case tomatoes, where we pretty much all know what the color is of a red tomato and the green foliage even, then it's, I would say, relatively easy to adjust the temperature and tint. So temperature is taking us between yellow and blue. So essentially, you might say adding yellow light versus adding blue light or compensating for light of a given color, however you want to look at it. And then the tint slider is going to allow us to shift between green and magenta. So kind of green and purple, essentially, you might think of it. And what I, the way I generally describe this is that the temperature is both corrective and creative because within a certain degree of poetic license, artistic license, we can push things just a little bit. You slept in till noon, but you shift the temperature a little bit more toward yellow to make people think you actually got up early enough for the sunrise, right? I mean, I would never do that, of course, but <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Uh, but you know, we can't go way out over here. So we've got a little bit more artistic license when it comes to the temperature slider. The tint slider I really think of as being purely corrective. Most photographers I talk to are not interested in a magenta cast or a green cast, but they might want to add a nice kind of golden yellow cast, or they might even want a nice cool cast, like a winter shot. So generally, we're going to make very small adjustments with tint and possibly a little bit stronger adjustment with temperature. But to me, the best approach is to grab those sliders and play with them. Now, how many of you feel that you don't have a good eye for color? Only a few. How many of you don't have a good eye for color, but you don't want to say so in front of everybody else? <laughs> okay, most of them. So I find a lot of photographers feel that they don't have a lot of confidence in their ability to analyze the color in a photo and to make adjustments to correct the color in the photo. And so to them, I say, swing wildly back and forth. If you've ever done macro photography, the most frustrating type of photography ever, I think, you probably are familiar with, you know, in very narrow depth of field and having a hard time getting that focus exactly where you want it. And so you're, you know, adjusting in and out, trying to get that focus just right. Eventually your eye starts like falling asleep and you can't tell what's in focus versus what isn't. So you throw it way out of focus and start to bring it back into focus. And the least blurry position, that's sharp, yeah. right? We've all had that experience. Well, it's the same sort of concept with the color adjustments. If I swing this way out over here, we know that looks just really ridiculous. It's way too yellow. And over here, it looks uh, you know, arguably more natural, certainly, than going all the way over toward the yellow. But you can still see that there's just a little bit of kind of muddiness in some of the reds, especially the highlights. And the greens don't look quite right. They don't look very healthy. So somewhere over in here. So by swinging through those extremes, then we can kind of start to zero in on the more natural appearing color. But again, that's kind of easy when we're talking about memory colors, objects for which we just sort of intuitively know the color. What about then we, we get out into the real world and maybe you're photographing flowers that you're not familiar with. These happen to be, well, we call them canola. It's not, not actually canola in this case, but these canola fields is in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. And the sky, well, we all know what a blue sky looks like except there's like a billion different possible shades of blue, even for a blue sky, right? How cyan versus cobalt was it? And so as you're trying to make this adjustment, it could be a little bit more tricky. And there again, swinging through those extremes, moonlit night versus uh, sunset, we'll call it. <laughs> and then trying to find that balance in between. And really, I think paying careful attention, first and foremost, to the neutral areas of the image, by which I mean the stuff that ought to be gray, some shade of gray. But be careful not to be tricked. This is one of the biggest mistakes I think photographers make, at least in concept. They'll say, well, why don't you just use a gray card? I wish that were truly possible. Because if a gray card was a good solution to getting accurate color with outdoor photography, I could do all of my photography at high noon on a clear, sunny day. None of that golden hour stuff. 
right? Because with a gray card, we're essentially stripping out all of the color of the light, trying to make the scene look like it were illuminated with pure white light, at least in theory. And that's not what we're usually or even often trying to accomplish. So here, for example, do I want the clouds, the bases of the clouds at least, are pretty gray. Do I want them to be perfectly, absolutely neutral gray? Or might I want just a little bit of color? It depends. In this case, I might want to have a little bit of a yellowish tint or even a little bit of a bluish tint or whatever the case might be. So I'll want to think about what theoretically is neutral in the scene and do I actually want it neutral in that scene, all right? And very often we don't. We want it to be just a little bit golden or you know, cooler or whatever the case may be. Now usually, I'll have gotten my color reasonably close, mostly because if the color's off, it's going to annoy me. And if I'm annoyed about the color, I can't really focus on the tonality in the image. But then I get to move on to the tonality. So let's take a look, first and foremost, at the histogram in this case. And you can see that I was being apparently extremely cautious. Actually, I was being um, more like spastic in this case. Uh, these clouds were moving really fast. It was very windy. The clouds were moving quick. We were so excited because we get these shadows being cast across the landscape. It was really pretty magical. And it was happening fast. And so I was using a manual exposure, trying to lock in an exposure that would ensure that I was not clipping the highlights. The problem is every now and then it would get so dark because there would be you know, a cloud overhead that my exposure was a little bit off. So it wasn't necessarily the best strategy, but it wasn't the worst strategy either. It worked pretty well. Now, normally, I don't even touch the exposure slider. Don't even touch the exposure slider. Mostly because right out of the camera, all my exposures are perfect. I had to go digging and digging to try to find this picture just to have an example of one that wasn't just spot on right out of the camera. No, that's not true, but I would love it if you would believe it. I don't touch the contrast slider because I pretty much never need it. Not because the picture was good out of the camera necessarily, but because I'm going to use different techniques. But in this case, the exposure was a little bit off, I would say. And by off, I don't mean that I clipped anything. You can see from the histogram, nothing is clipped in terms of highlights or shadows. But rather, it's a little bit overall dark. I think overall the exposure should be a little bit brighter. Not by very much, but because I'm talking about just a general brightening of the frame, I'm going to take that exposure slider and drag it upward just a little bit. And you'll notice that the value there is essentially fractional. That's actually EV values. So plus one represents a one-stop increase in exposure, and plus two represents a two-stop increase, et cetera. In this case, I've taken it up to 0.4, and that looks pretty good to my eyes, so I think we're okay there. A little under a half-stop increase in that exposure value. But that's again, is something that I won't do unless I feel that the image just overall had an exposure that was slightly off. In other words, I wished I had had the camera set slightly differently in order to produce a better exposure. Instead, I'll, I'll focus my attention on the whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows sliders. I wish they'd put these in my order. They didn't. Adobe didn't. They put them in somebody else's order. So I have to go out of order here, but I'm used to doing that. Uh, so I'm going to hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh so that I can get the clipping preview, which is a fancy way of saying I want to be able to somewhat carefully set the white point so that the brightest pixel in the image is about white. And then I'll increase the value for whites. So you notice that histogram jumping way over. But notice also that the histogram is stretching a bit. We're affecting the highlights, the bright areas of the image, more than we're affecting the darker shadows. Once I start to see pixels appear, that indicates that I am losing detail in one or more channels within the photo. How much detail do I want to sacrifice in the highlights? Pretty much none. Maybe a tiny little bit sometimes, but generally not very much and possibly none. <coughs> so a sort of typical approach for me would be to, again, holding the Alt or Option key on the keyboard, drag that white slider over to the right till I start to see pixels appearing, and then go back to the left just to the point that the last of those pixels disappear, or maybe where there's just a few of those pixels in the image. Then comes the most important part, the reality check. I let go of the Alt or Option key, and I want to evaluate the result. What have we done to the image? Is that good or bad? Well, it's sort of hard to make a determination 
just yet because we still have some other sliders that we want to take a look at. And part of this process is stretching out our tonal information so that we have whites and blacks, full contrast range, etc., which usually is a good goal for an image, but it's not always the right approach for an image. So we'll want to check the image once we're finished with this basic process. So I'm going to go now to the blacks slider, once again holding the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh, and then I'll drag that slider over toward the left until I start to see pixels appearing. In other words, until I'm starting to lose detail in the photo, in this case, at the darkest values in the image. And then I'll bring that slider back over toward the right until those pixels, generally speaking, disappear. I might be willing to sacrifice shadow detail. Maybe. But I'm almost never willing to sacrifice highlight detail. Now, if it's a specular highlight, you know, bright reflections off of shiny objects, sure, that's okay. But generally speaking, the highlights I want to preserve. Shadows, you know, silhouette, dark shadows, I'm not so worried about that. So it just depends on what the image calls for, essentially. Then I get to move on to probably my favorite tonal adjustments of all in Lightroom's develop module, and that is highlights and shadows. And here we can brighten or darken the highlights or the shadows in the image. And that's a lot of control. So much control that I virtually never use the tone curve, and I virtually never use the contrast slider because these sliders let me take care of my needs there. So highlights, let's start with that. Have we lost detail in the clouds? No, we have not even lost detail in a single pixel in the image. And I know that for a fact because I used the clipping preview in conjunction with that white slider. So I know that all of the information is there. So if I make a print of this image and hang it up on the wall and someone says, oh, the detail in the clouds has been lost, I can tell them scientifically that that information is really there. That probably won't help very much, though, <laughs> if they can't really make out that detail. And so what we want to do is both enhance contrast and tone down the tonal values for those bright highlights so that we can perceive more information there. It's there. It's just that the differences in tonal values are so subtle that our eyes aren't able to make them out very well. And so if I drag that highlight slider over toward the left, I can darken up those highlights. So I don't know how well you can see it up there. Reasonably well. Yeah, probably better over on the screens over here. You can see there's brightening the highlights, and there's darkening those highlights. And so you see that we're just enhancing the detail in the highlights. I'll leave that up, uh, set down to its minimum value of minus 100 right now. And then the shadows, same basic concept. Mostly the, the shadow slider really is the philosophical slider because this depends on your philosophy as a photographer. Do you want lots of detail in every nook and cranny or are you more interested in having a little bit more contrast and drama? I like the drama and so more often than not I'm going to darken down the shadows but some photographers might want to open up the shadows. And look at how cool is that? Is that amazing? I can just sit here and do this all day, except <laughs> that won't make the recording on YouTube all that interesting, will it? So I might tone down those shadows just a little bit, maybe make it more dramatic. Here I've obviously kind of overemphasized that a little bit. But you get the idea here is that we're able to really control this contrast, not just global contrast in the image, but contrast in the context of highlight detail and shadow detail, or highlight brightness and shadow brightness, uh, with the ability to both brighten and darken independently. So what about those highlights? Even with the value set to minus 100, I would say that's still a little too much kind of blown out looking in the highlights. Well, that's because I was a bit aggressive with those whites. So while generally I do want to set the black and white values so that I'm stretching my histogram out and I'm maximizing my tonal range, that doesn't always work for the final image. In this case, I don't feel that it works, and so I would back off those highlights just a little bit using the whites control. So again, setting that endpoint inward a little bit so that the brightest value in my image is not a pure white, but in this case, I think that works perfectly fine. We've got this sort of side lighting, the light's coming from way over to my side, and so although we do have really strong light, all things considered, I don't need a pure white in the image for those clouds. All right? So that covers what are, I would consider most of the basics. In theory, the basic section here also includes the presence set of controls, but those ones are so important that they get their own tip, and that is to embrace presence. If you have never 
messed with the presence controls in Lightroom, you need to, to play with these. And same adjustments. I should point out that all of these adjustments are also available in the latest version of Adobe Camera Raw if you're a Photoshop user. You can think of the two as basically being interchangeable. But these presence controls are phenomenal. So let's take a look at an example. Speaking of presence, I didn't really want to show you a picture of me. I mean, you know, because of my humility. Um, but I wanted to point out first and foremost before we turn, on, turn our attention to a real picture. Actually, <laughs> this picture is very real because a good friend of mine took it. But um, Vibrance. I can crank up the vibrance and we're cranking up the saturation. But we're doing so with some built-in self-control. Let's go ahead and take a look at what saturation does. Saturation and people, not such a good combination. It's like I forgot my sunscreen for a very long time and was uh, very sick, apparently, a little jaundiced. Whereas with Vibrance, even taking it all the way to its maximum, notice that the skin tones, of course, they're getting more saturated. But they don't look ridiculous the way they do when I crank up the saturation. And that's because the Vibrance control actually protects skin tones. It actually analyzes the color values in the photos, and if they fall within a range of typical skin tone values, it will not exaggerate the adjustment for those colors in the photo. That is huge. Also, beyond that, it just has self-control. It's not really self-control. It's just that the algorithm behind it is pretty <coughs> sophisticated. In essence, the way you can think of this is that the vibrance adjustment, it is a saturation adjustment, but it's having a stronger effect. When we increase vibrance, we're having a stronger effect on the colors that are not very saturated, and we're having a more subtle effect on the colors that are saturated. And so it's sort of like a saturation equalizer. We're boosting the saturation of the colors that need it because they weren't very saturated to begin with without making the colors that were saturated look completely ridiculous. So we're sort of equalizing the level of saturation or focusing it where it's most needed. It's wonderful. Did I mention that I love the Vibrant slider? And so I'll use the Vibrant slider pretty you know, generously. I don't mind cranking it up just a little bit to equalize saturation, but at that point, we might have saturation that's a little bit too high, so we need to lower the overall level. So a very common thing that I will do, a little bonus tip here, is to increase vibrance until the not-so-saturated colors look good or maybe a little too saturated, and then reduce the value for saturation to kind of tone things down overall. So we're equaling satura equalizing saturation and then toning it down a little bit so it doesn't get out of hand. Great little way to approach using vibrance plus saturation together. Let's talk about clarity. Clarity is actually probably one of the best named controls in Lightroom because it increases clarity. And that pretty well explains what it's doing. It's enhancing contrast, but on a local level. You can sort of think of the clarity slider as being like sharpening but sharpening across a larger distance in your image. Instead of sharpening, increasing contrast at the very fine detail edges in your photo, we're spreading that out a little bit more. The result can be pretty dramatic. I think of it as the haze buster, essentially. So if I crank up that clarity value, there's the before, back there, and there's the after. And especially, look at, I mean, the background certainly, but look at the foreground, all the little houses and buildings in the foreground. It almost goes from this kind of hazy, foggy appearance to this really crisp, lots of detail kind of appearance. And then the detail in the Duomo here, you can see we go from, yeah, there's, it's sharp, there's good detail, but now we're really giving it some nice impact. We can also use a negative clarity if we're so inclined. And that will, instead of reducing haze, it'll essentially increase haze, you might say. So something like this, and we get that kind of dreamlike hazy, ethereal type of a look. Usually works nicely for portraits, for flower photography, for abstracts, you know, certain subjects it'll work pretty nicely for. For me personally, I tend to crank up the clarity a little bit and try and boost the detail in the image. And certainly, a little bit of vibrance never hurt, did it? <coughs> so those presence adjustments, I, they're just, they're so simple. And once you understand them, they're really easy to use. It's kind of difficult to get carried away with them, 
because they do a pretty good job of protecting your image, all things considered. I mean, obviously, it's possible to get carried away. But by and large, they do a pretty good job where even if you're a little heavy-handed, you're not going to create problems for the image. And it can really increase the impact of a photo. All right, tip number three. Isolate colors. Isolate colors. Now, we've already talked about basic color adjustments. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of the targeted adjustment capabilities that are built into Lightroom. But we actually have the ability to control individual colors. And I think this is one of the most overlooked capabilities in terms of color adjustments. Sure, we want to make sure that the color overall is accurate with our temperature and tint sliders, for example. But let's really focus our attention on specific colors within the photo. And more importantly, problematic colors within the photo. So in this case, the color came out pretty nicely, very minor adjustments to temperature and tint, and things are looking pretty good as far as the accuracy of the color, I thought. But I'm really, really easily annoyed, for those of you who have gotten to know me a little bit. And when I notice something in a picture, it drives me totally crazy, and I cannot let go of it until I fixed it. Um, in theory, that's a good thing, because then I really make sure my pictures look great except then I never feel like I actually finished a picture. There's always something else that catches my eye. And one of the things, I'm not sure how easily you'll be able to see it right off the bat, but these cliffs way off in the distance. This is Horseshoe Bend, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, just outside of Page, Arizona, where you get to perch about 1,000 feet above the Colorado River and decide how close you're going to get to the edge to take that picture. And so, Back in the background, you can see a little bit of haze. It's an overcast day, a lot of moisture in the sky. And we've got a lot of moisture looking across a long distance. Some of that scatter of the light from that haze and the particulate matter in the air, et cetera. We usually get a little bit of a magenta color in the image. <coughs> and so even after I've gotten the color to be pretty accurate, I'm not really happy with the kind of purplish, pinkish kind of tones way back in this distance. In the foreground, I think the rocks look pretty accurate as far as their color, but in the background, I think not so much. I'm going to emphasize so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about back there. There is the kind of pink, purple, magenta sort of colors that are going on in the background that I don't think are good. How many of you saw that color before I cranked up the saturation? Just a few. How many of you see it now? <laughs> and how many think I'm totally crazy for zeroing in on these kind of times? Just a few of you? Thank you. <laughs> So by cranking up the saturation, so what I've done here is gone into the HSL section of adjustments on the right panel in the Develop module in Lightroom. That stands for Hue, Saturation, and Luminance, or Lightness, or Luminosity, depending on your preference. You could even say HSB, which is another color model where we just replace luminance with brightness. Same basic concept. Hue is degrees around the color wheel. Saturation is the purity or intensity of the color. And luminance, <laughs> luminosity, brightness, lightness, obviously, is just the degree of white versus black, the amount of light, you might say. Well, I've gone into the saturation set of controls here. And I've picked purple and magenta because that was pretty obvious to me. I could play with all of these if I wanted to, or just crank up the overall saturation that we saw up above in the presence set of controls to get a feel for what sorts of colors might be causing problems in the image. And just as I can exaggerate these colors so that you can better see them, I can also de-emphasize the colors. I'll go ahead and take these all the way down to their minimum value. And you can see, was the magenta in the background completely bad? No. no, because it was completely natural, really, all things considered. It was just bothering my eye a little bit. So I don't want to get rid of it altogether. So if you see some kind of magenta in the haze off in the distance, which is very common with landscape photos, for example, it doesn't mean that you just want to completely desaturate anything that gets even close to magenta, but you probably want to desaturate it a little bit. And so you've got to be careful not to strip out colors that are good in the image. We just want to tone down the colors that are kind of bothering us. So I'd probably go right about there, which is not too dramatic a change. I'll go ahead and turn off the adjustment and turn it back on again. There's off and on. And you see just a little bit of a shift from kind of pinkish to a little bit more neutral. It still has those earth tones, that kind of orangish color that uh, we'll find in the rocks here, of course. But we've gotten rid of the magenta that was bothering me. And we can do the same thing for any of the other colors. But just by way of example, I'll grab the green slider here 
and we'll kind of crank that up and down and you can see the river down below. There's a lot of green kind of algae and plants and whatnot. And so you can probably see that shifting from in the water, the greens going kind of neutral to the greens being very saturated. Or if I grab the yellows here, then we'll see a little bit more of an effect. And the oranges, especially in the rocks. There we go. Now it looks nice and orange. Late afternoon light. This was at sunset. Oh, wait, no, sunrise. Um, and you can see, you know, obviously we could get creative in terms of finding specific colors that we might want to take out of the image. But the point being is to actually focus on individual colors in the image. Now, for me personally, that usually means saturation. That usually means boosting certain colors or toning down certain colors. But it also might mean shifting certain colors. So maybe I decide that the yellows here were a little too kind of yellowish to green, and I want to shift them more toward a kind of rusty orange. Or if I go up here, there we go. It is red rock country, right? No. <laughs> So you can fine tune the individual colors based on their original color value, which can be tremendously helpful. So again, I usually take advantage of this capability in terms of saturation, but with minor adjustments, it can be very helpful for the hue as well, and also very minor adjustments for the luminance values. Uh, but it's one that it's definitely worth playing around with. Just be careful. You might get focused on a specific area of the image, You've got to remember that the color that you're trying to fix in one area might exist somewhere else, and it might not be a problem there. So be sure to evaluate the overall image as you make those fine-tuning adjustments. But the result can be a tremendous degree of control. I'll go ahead and show you the luminance value here. And you can see the risk. If we reduce luminance for a single color, we tend to get this kind of very muddy, washed out sort of a look. And you know, kind of this blown highlights, kind of weird HDR type of effect. So again, you'd have to be very, very modest with those adjustments. But if we just want to kind of brighten up only the rocks without brightening up the entire image, for example, that's one possibility. But that would sort of be a last resort for me personally. I would tend to use other approaches. But when it comes to saturation, I use this approach a lot. Uh, for those of you that feel like there's just way too many sliders here, I mean, I think it's cool because if anybody ever looks over my shoulder, like if I'm at a cafe, working on an image and they see all this. I mean, it looks like I'm getting ready to launch a space shuttle or something. And so to me, it's really cool. But if you find it intimidating, you can also choose which sliders are currently visible. So you'll notice up above, I've got a link for hue. So I see only the hue sliders for each of the color values, saturation, and luminance. Or I can go to all if I want to see all of them. There's also a color option. Don't be fooled. They're the same sliders. This is just another way of organizing them. Do I, do I want to see hue for every color, then saturation for every color, then luminance for every color, or do I want to see HSL for the reds and HSL for the oranges, et cetera? Same sliders, different presentation. But you know, again, I wish we could have all of these all at the same time, because then it's like twice as like you're launching two space shuttles <laughs> at one time. All right. Number four. This is a big one for. Well, for several reasons. First, I don't like noise. And second, I, think, I feel like, I could be wrong about this, but I think a lot of photographers dismiss noise as no longer being a problem in digital photography. I hope you're not among those. Has it gotten a lot better to where we don't have to worry so much and we can crank up our ISOs higher than we ever could? Of course, and that's a wonderful thing. But don't <laughs> ignore noise. It's a really important factor when it comes to overall image quality. It can make a tremendous difference. You don't necessarily have to crank up your ISO to get a lot of noise. You can get a lot of noise when the camera's getting really hot. You can get a lot of noise with long exposures. So there's all sorts of possibilities there. The other thing, it's not a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of. Lightroom, by default, applies some noise reduction to your image. So you might take an image here. This image happens to have been captured at 6,400 ISO. And I won't tell you which camera, but it's a camera that I don't think is really all that great when it comes to noise performance. But 6,400 ISO, still, that's, that's pretty significant uh, in terms of ISO setting. How many stops is that compared to one? Six stops. See how fast I can do that math in my head? That's six stops of underexposure and then having the camera amplify the signal to pretend like it wasn't six stops underexposed. That's pretty significant. Then we zoom in on the photo, and what's our reaction? It's really not bad, right? 
Who thinks it's horrible? Who thinks it's horrible in terms of color noise? Your eyes are too good. No, but you know, in fairness, this doesn't look really, really horrible. And if I told you it was 6400 ISO with a camera that doesn't have all that great a uh, performance when it comes to noise, then you might say, oh, it seems not, I, I would have thought it would have been worse. At least can we agree on that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Only because we're friends. All right, but I'm going to turn off the details section, and now we're going to have a completely different attitude. In fact, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. We're going to go to a four to one zoom, just so we really can get a close look at all those beautifully colored pixels in the image. So once again, I'm going to turn on my detail adjustments and turn them back off. And hopefully now you can appreciate what I was referring to here. Lightroom is basically tricking you into thinking your camera is better than it is. It's probably a good thing because it's helping make sure that you've got a little bit of noise reduction applied to the image, but we can do better. So number one, don't ignore noise and don't forget that there's a little bit of color noise reduction being applied by default in Lightroom. So I'll go ahead and just slide that color value all the way down to its minimum. You can see the noise once again. And I'll start to increase it. But the problem is that Lightroom is still making things look not as bad as they really are. Because as soon as I have any value at all for the color slider, it starts at a value of 25, the smoothness slider is helping things out as well. So I'm gonna take that down to its minimum value and then start to increase the value for color. And I'm not gonna take it up too high. <clears throat> this is a value of 14, which is below the default setting in Lightroom. And especially on the displays over here, you can probably see now we've transitioned away from pixels. So I'll turn off this adjustment. There's what I call pixels of noise, individual tiny pixels that are really, really saturated. And those have now transitioned into blobs of noise, very technical term. We've kind of blurred each individual colored pixel of noise to blend it in with the surrounding area. So now instead of being a little spot of color, it's an area, it's a smear of color in the image. In a way, that's almost worse, I would say. And neither of them are very good. But if we increase the value for color, we can start to get to a point where we're getting rid of that. <clears throat> now those smears have gotten a lot bigger and more faint, but they're still there. Well, the problem is that with noise reduction, we're really compromising in terms of image quality. With color, it's not super drastic, but it's still a compromise. We're reducing saturation, we're blending colors together, we might create some kind of blooming effects where the color in one area blends out into another area of the photo. So we don't want to get too carried away. Well, right up somewhere around here, I start to say, well, gee, those blobs are still there, but they've gotten a lot more faint. That's where the smoothness slider comes in. This is a relatively new addition to Lightroom. I couldn't quote you exactly which version number off the top of my head, but watch this. As I increase the value for smoothness, the rest of the noise just disappears. Color noise, I should say, disappears. Pretty significant and tremendously helpful. So I don't have to be quite as aggressive with that color value, which is the strength of the noise reduction, because smoothness helps me blend the result a little more effectively into the rest of the image. So there's, for those of you that are able to see those color blobs, smoothness down at its minimum value, then up to its maximum value. But notice again, if you take a look at the corner of the Colosseum that's visible there, take a look at the color there as we increase smoothness. See how we're blending the color of the Colosseum up into the sky and we're reducing saturation? So we still need to be careful here. We don't want to get too carried away with our noise reduction and at the moment, we're only looking at color noise reduction. But again, it's a compromise. And then we turn our attention to luminance noise reduction, which is even scarier. Color noise reduction actually works pretty well. And Lightroom, in more recent versions, I believe this changed at about version number four, give or take, where they made some significant changes to noise reduction. And it really made a huge, huge difference. And I would say Lightroom now is among the best in terms of noise reduction for your photos. Luminance noise reduction, though, no matter how good the noise reduction software is, you cannot get away from the fact that luminance noise reduction causes a reduction in detail in your photos. You can see here I've cranked up luminance 
for noise reduction all the way to its maximum value of 100. And I defy you to find any noise in the photo. <laughs> or to find any detail in the photo. So that really underscores that degree of compromise, especially when it comes to luminance noise reduction, obviously. So even here, you know, still a fairly strong value, we can still see a little bit of the noise. It kind of looks more like film grain now, but we still do have that noise. But look at the degree of loss of detail and texture in the photo. So when it comes to luminance noise reduction, we really have to compromise a lot more. I'll usually only go up to maybe somewhere between 10 and 15 as a value for luminance before I just say, well, next time I'm going to take a more expensive camera <laughs> or I'm going to leave it set to 100 ISO, you know, or whatever it takes to try to minimize that noise. Obviously, with night photography, this can be a particular challenge because it's either high ISO or it's long exposure, both of which lead to noise. So. Uh, always a compromise when it comes to noise, but fortunately cameras are getting better and better over time in terms of performance on the noise front, even at high ISO settings. But the most important thing I think is just to pay attention and really take a close look at the image, turn off the detail section so that we're getting a look at the image without noise reduction, and then take a look at what the photo really looks like and continue from there. And probably fine tune those settings for noise reduction at least a little bit. And again, focusing primarily on color noise because that's where you're able to have the most impact and then being a little bit more careful when it comes to luminance noise reduction. All right, chromatic aberrations. This one, mostly you want to learn about chromatic aberrations um, for when you're at a cocktail party or some other social event. And I mean, it's, it's hard not to sound really smart when you say chromatic aberrations. Just talk about, you know, I was doing some night photography and the images were really spectacular, of course, as you might have expected. Uh, but the chromatic aberrations from that lens, they were just... Oh, you've probably dealt with that, haven't you? These, this is how I have fun. <laughs> so, chromatic aberrations, people will tell you, well, that you, if you get chromatic aberrations, people, I don't know who these people are, I've never actually heard them, but apparently they say these things. If you're getting chromatic aberrations, it's because you're using cheap lenses. I promise you, that's not really true. The lens... Actually, yes, okay. The lens for this picture, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it, this is the rating that it got. And the graphic shows four. It's actually 4.7 stars out of five after, how many is that? 816 reviews. An overwhelmingly positive review. It's a great lens, but it's a wide angle lens, as you can tell by the photo here, the perspective of the photo. So chromatic aberrations, common with Yes, cheap lenses for sure, but also wide-angle lenses in particular. Not exclusively, but it's more predominant with wide-angle lenses. What is a chromatic aberration besides a fancy word that you'll want to use at cocktail parties? The simple way I think of explaining it is the more common cause of chromatic aberration. It's just color fringing, uh, but I generally describe it as one of the primary causes of chromatic aberrations. It's when certain wavelengths of light are out of focus when the rest of the wavelengths of light were in focus. What happens when something's out of focus? It gets fuzzy. If it's only a specific wavelength or range of wavelengths of light that's out of focus or fuzzy, then that wavelength is going to represent fuzziness in the image. There's other causes, but that's sort of one way to think about chromatic aberration. <laughs> Most importantly, it's really not very attractive. And the problem is, when you're working on your image, if you're not zooming in periodically to check specific details and quality factors, etc., it looks fine. And this, if anybody has ever struggled with self-esteem issues, I've got years of experience here, I can help you. As a photographer, when it comes to improving your self-esteem, one of the worst things you can ever do is zoom in on a picture. The best thing you could do is zoom out. Sometimes I'll even take off my glasses, and if it looks out of focus, I just figure it's because I'm not wearing my glasses, and the picture actually looks way better. But if you want the picture to look its best, you've got to, you know, get over the self-esteem thing, maybe some therapy or something, I don't know. It's, I've been trying, but um, still low self-esteem, as you can tell. But now we've got these color fringes. This is a problem, and if you don't zoom in and check the detail in the picture, you're not going to see this stuff until when? Oh, man. 
<laughs> yeah, till it's too late. I mean, fortunately, printing an image is super cheap, right? I mean, the inks, they practically give them away. Um, and how big, you know, I mean, a picture like this, how big are you going to print it? Big. Big. Oh, man, we're going to 20 by 30 up on the wall. And then what's going to happen? You're going to be crying for three days because you're going to see this and think of how much money and ink you just wasted. And now every time you walk past this image, you can't help but stare at the chromatic aberration. It will drive you crazy. So you must check. Now, especially when you're using a lens that you know is going to have a little bit higher risk. So wide-angle lenses, a little bit less expensive lenses. Um, and also when you're dealing with a backlit, high-contrast subject. That's not to say that's the only time you'll run into chromatic aberrations, but it's when they'll be most likely to occur, and it's also when they're going to be most visible. They just stand out a little bit better, as you can see here. So then what do we do? Well, we're going to come down here to lens corrections. We'll take a closer look at this uh, for a couple different images in a moment. We're just going to focus our attention on the color tab, as it were, of the lens corrections section here on the right panel in the develop module. And have a look here. Remove chromatic aberration. <laughs> what could be easier? We just turn on a checkbox. And I mean, come on now. There should be like cheers. Look at that. Before, after. Before, after. You're not impressed. Tough, tough crowd. I was so excited when the room was filled to overflowing, and now a complete lack of enthusiasm. All right, fine. But I do find that about half the time, checking that checkbox, turning that checkbox on, is all I need. About half the time. That's not bad. One click, that's pretty good odds. In this case, what percent improvement would you say it gave us? 90%. 90% improvement of a real big problem, and I don't even get any round of applause. No <laughs> roses being thrown up on the... No. So, we need to fix it. Well, fortunately, we have some more controls at our disposal, these defringe controls. And you'll see that we have an amount slider for purple and for green. And you'll see that we've got, you know, kind of a cyanish looking color, a little bit greenish up here for the, the uh, chromatic aberration up on the top of the tower there. And then a little kind of reddish, almost magenta-ish. So probably we're going to need, need to use both of these sliders, right? So I'll go ahead and increase the value for defringe for the magentas. And I'll increase it for the greens. Oh, now we're getting a little happier, aren't we? We're almost there. Except it didn't quite give us all the correction we need. Now we're 98.44%. Well, we can adjust the color range for each of those sliders. So for example, the purples it helped a lot, but I still see little bits of kind of cyan color in there. So let me expand this range of colors. These two sliders, everything in between is what's being targeted. So if I spread those out a little bit, there we go. Now we have corrected the chromatic aberration by 227%. Now we should be really happy. So we've taken things a little bit too far. And here's where it starts to get a little bit tricky. We either need to reduce the amount, the intensity of the correction, or we need to fine tune the range of colors. Now, probably it's fairly obvious here. You can see that slider. I'm moving toward the cyans. What color is the sky? Basically cyan, kind of a cyan shade of blue. So I have to fine tune to try to improve my results here. Take this down, and we'll take this back over, etc. So maybe somewhere around there. We can continue playing with that to make sure that we're getting a great result. We also want to be sure that we're checking multiple areas of the photo. So just because we corrected it in one spot doesn't mean we've got everything corrected perfectly everywhere. And sometimes you'll find that we have one color in one area and an opposite color in another area, and fixing it in one place actually makes it a little bit worse in the other place. Sometimes there's going to be some compromise involved. But I would definitely want to go check out various areas of the photo. This looks pretty good over here. So we can kind of zoom in and out on different portions of the photo. Here we've got a little bit of the green still, for example. So I'll go ahead and crank that up and maybe shift this over toward the left, et cetera. 
you get the idea. We're adjusting both the intensity of the correction and the specific color range being targeted. You'll have to kind of go back and forth between those sets of adjustments until you get it absolutely perfect or as close to perfect as you are able to. And it will vary depending on the strength of the chromatic aberration, um, and, you know, the specific colors, et cetera, as to how good a result you're able to accomplish. But by and large, you'll be able to get a very, very good result. Worthy of hanging on the wall and not annoying you as you walk by. So taking this one step further, correcting for the lens. Well, this is a little bit of a misnomer, actually, in fairness. Sometimes, anyway. But correcting for the lens. This, the reason I call this correcting for the lens uh, is two things. Number one, not wanting to take responsibility. Uh, and number two, because it's in the lens corrections section. So I was just following Lightroom's protocol there. Uh, but we'll start with an image where we're not actually correcting for the lens. We're correcting for me. I'll admit it. I should have brought a ladder or a helicopter or a tight, uh, tight wire, tight rope. What do you call it? The walk? There were a couple buildings on either side of me. I could have strung it across the top and walked and balanced with my tripod. Uh, because this really is not the lens's fault, right? This is my fault for being too low. I'm not orthogonal to my subject, and so the building kind of goes away from me, you might say. It's like it's leaning away or it's pinched in up at the top. And I didn't have a ladder with me, and so now I've got to try and you know, fix this another way. I'm going to go to the basic section here, and we've got these upright controls. This, too, is relatively new in Lightroom. We also have the manual controls. So in older versions of Lightroom, the manual controls were essentially all we had. And so we could, oops, wrong way. Oh, too much. There we go, something around about there, right? I mean, sort of. But you get the idea. But now we have these upright set of controls. Now I could apply a profile correction. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. That's good. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but for now, let's focus our attention on the set of upright controls. And this essentially just lets Lightroom do all the work for me. That's my favorite way to work. One click and call it good, hopefully. So we've got auto, level, vertical, and full. We'll start off with level. Pretty straightforward. It's really just a horizon straightener. So literally rotate the image so that the horizon is straight. Obviously, sometimes it's not a horizon. Maybe it's a building that's vertical some other horizontal line, whatever it may be. Lightroom analyzes the image and tries to figure out how much it needs to rotate the image to make it straight as far as, for lack of a better word, a straight horizon. Vertical takes that level adjustment and adds a vertical perspective correction to the image, hopefully making all the lines straight as they should be. So you know, making the building look like we were up on a ladder to get a nice straight orthogonal shot. And then full adds horizontal, which in this case is a really minor adjustment because I had been pretty careful to stand at the exact center of the building. It's just that the lens mount on my camera is not totally centered on the camera. Um, and so it was off just a tiny little bit. That's why. <laughs> had to try. So you can see just a tiny, again, only because of the position of the lens mount on my camera, not that I didn't pick the exact center point of the building when I was standing. So a little bit of a horizontal correction. You can kind of think of it as you know, leaning the building back and forth almost, if you were holding a print in your hand kind of a thing. And then auto, a lot of photographers think that, or not think, but just assume that auto must mean that Lightroom will automatically choose which one of those three buttons ought to have been clicked. Actually, it's much more complicated than that. It does this whole three-dimensional transformation thing. Look at that. Why even mess with all these other <laughs> buttons when I can just one click and done? Which is why I picked this image to show you this technique. It doesn't always, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it, I don't know what it is looking at in the picture, but it must not have found a straight line anywhere because it just gets it all sorts of out of whack. But by and large, it does a pretty darn good job. And so this is a really good place to start, even if you just click on each of these four buttons or turn it off altogether if you decide it's not working well. But it usually provides you with a really good starting point for adjusting for camera distortion to a certain extent. I find, at least for me, that that's usually 
personal distortion. You know, I wasn't high enough or in quite the right position to get orthogonal to that subject, meaning head on to the subject. In this case, wanting to be a little bit higher so that I'm not shooting upward at the, the uh, church, the cathedral in this case, that I'd be shooting straight on at it. All right. And we can still, if it's not quite perfect, in this case, I've got a little bit of that, you know, barrel versus pin cushion distortion. And so I might want to come in here and fine tune. So I'll grab that distortion slider and I can stretch and pinch the image. Paying attention, notice those grid lines so that I can try to make it just absolutely perfect and maybe rotate a little bit more in the vertical orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, before we depart this image, Hopefully you can appreciate just how great this could be potentially. Uh, it underscores a few other things relative to applying these sorts of corrections. Number two, you might notice that I'm bowing in the edge of the photo. So in order to make that, you know, the top of the building in the right position, in other words, not leaning away from me, but kind of make it lean toward me until it's straight kind of a thing, notice how I'm having to essentially tilt the photo, as it were, and that causes the bottom of the image to pinch in while the top of the photo spreads out. If I have to apply too strong a correction, you can probably imagine that my cropping will start to infringe upon the very thing that I'm trying to straighten. Which means when I'm out there shooting a subject like this where I know this is a possible issue, I need to shoot a little bit wider than I otherwise would so that I've got that room to crop. So I didn't really want this building in the frame over on the left-hand side. I wanted just the cathedral, but I needed to shoot it a little bit wide so that after I apply that distortion correction, I can crop and still retain all image. The other thing, if you pay attention, I'd rather you didn't, but if you pay attention to the bottom center of the photo, let's get this pretty close, right about there without scrutinizing too closely. It looks like I've got the cathedral reasonably squared up. Now take a look at the bottom center of the photo, and we've got this line in the road. And then if anybody asks about that, you just say, well, you know, it's a circular driveway <laughs> that leads up to the cathedral. I don't know, you've never been there, I guess, but <laughs> then they ask you where it's at, and you might have to like make up your own city name or you know, invent a different name of the cathedral so that they can't go Google it or something. Uh, but that becomes a little bit of a problem. Now, if I crop in from the bottom, that would certainly help because we get away from the area that needed to be adjusted a lot and into where it's not as much of an, an adjustment, so it's not as obvious. Where, you know, how much do you want to crop, et cetera. So there is the potential for a lot of compromise here, which you know, the lesson learned, obviously, is bring a ladder. <laughs> Seems reasonable. I don't know. Getting a ladder on a flight might be a little bit of a challenge. but. So let's take a look at uh, what I think of as a little bit more realistic example. It's a much more subtle example, but as you've probably picked up on by now, I'm usually a very subtle person, and so the uh, subtle thing actually works really well for me. Um, but subtle, I really, I scrutinize my picture so much. It probably accounts for most of my self-esteem issues. I'm really looking for every little possible thing that I can fix. Every little thing that I can fix and trying to take that image as far toward perfection as I possibly can. And so often that means looking for problems that aren't glaring, or where the problem is a really, really tiny problem that you might not even call a problem if you hadn't paid attention to it. And I would say that that's the case for this image. Uh, I love this image. I'm very happy with this image. Um, it took a long time to coordinate for these clouds to be there. It's very expensive. Um, I, I have to go back and look. I actually think this is in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington State. Many of you might be where I basically go there every year and lead photo workshops and absolutely love it. Uh, I've been going for something like 10 years now. I have to go count how many pictures I have taken of this specific house. I must have visited this house uh, more than 100 times because every time I'm there, I make multiple visits, etc. And this, I'm almost certain, I have to double check this, but since we, you can't double check it, you'll just assume that I'm right, I hope. I'm pretty sure this is the very first time I visited this house. And the sky was amazing. And it's never looked that good since. But don't tell anybody who attends my workshop that, because 
They have to think this is possible. No, uh, wonderful sky. I mean, it really, to me, the sky makes the photo. Yes, of course, it's an old abandoned farmhouse, and that's cool, and it's a wheat field, and that's cool, but the sky really kind of makes it, because otherwise there's the potential for it to be a little bit of a drab scene. And so, you know, you get excited with the clouds and trying to enhance the detail in the clouds and you know, make sure the colors look good, etc. And so you might not pay attention to lens distortion issues. This shot was captured at a focal length of 16 millimeters. It's a pretty wide-angle lens. We're going to have some degree of distortion. And so if I enable profile correction, I might not expect to see much, but actually, if you pay careful attention, so there's before and there's after. Well, what's actually happening? Two basic things, you might say. Correcting for the distortion in terms of the bending of the light, as it were, kind of barrel versus pin cushion, et cetera. You notice that horizon kind of straightens out a little bit, even though you know, it's rolling hills, so it's hard to discern a horizon there. But you see how it straightens things out. But we're also correcting for the vignetting, which of course is very common with a wide angle lens. We're taking all this light from this really wide viewpoint and bending it to make it go to the film plane or the image sensor in the camera, and there's going to be some natural fall off of the light out toward those edges, and so we get a vignetting around the corners. Well, this profile correction is literally compensating for the behavior of the lens. This time it's not my fault, for once. It's the behavior of the lens itself a little bit of distortion. Now sometimes that distortion is a wonderful thing. A fisheye lens, for example, you don't want to get rid of the distortion there. But more often than not, you'll find the distortion is at least a little bit problematic. So I can enable profile correction. This is on that profile tab underneath lens corrections. And then I can configure my settings. In other words, really just choose a profile. In other words, tell Lightroom which lens was used. But the thing is, Lightroom can figure it out for me. If I choose auto, it should go find the values in metadata. In this case, I probably stripped out the metadata or something. It should go find those values out of metadata and set it. But if not, you can go establish the camera make, the specific lens that was used. I'll go ahead and click this pop-up list. And you can see I've got quite a few lenses to choose from. Not every lens that's out there, but a pretty good number of lenses you'll find. And we've got all these different manufacturers here. so. If it had been shot with a Tamron lens, for example, here's a set of Tamron lenses. See, a pretty exhaustive list, all things considered. But in this case, it was indeed that Canon 10 to 22 on a crop sensor, so that gives you an effective focal length of 16 millimeters. And you can see, more importantly, perhaps, the specific profile. This is an Adobe profile for this specific lens. And that's what allows me to apply that automatic correction for the behavior of the lens. Well, from, a, from the perspective of distortion, I would say that's a good adjustment. I'm happy with that. From the standpoint of vignetting, actually that's sometimes part of the reason that I like a wide angle lens, is that kind of natural, subtle light fall off toward the edges. You get kind of a natural framing for the scene. I actually think it's kind of cool, or at least most of the time I sort of like it. So I wished that it had corrected the distortion but that it left alone or at least didn't have such a strong effect on the vignetting. Well, have a look down here. We've got distortion and vignetting sliders. If I feel that the distortion correction was too strong or not strong enough, I can fine tune. Notice as I dramatically swing all the way between the maximum values that I'm not really having a huge impact on the photo. And that's because this is just compensating. You'll remember with those manual adjustments, we could have a really dramatic effect on the image. Here, we're just mitigating one way or the other the effect of the distortion correction. So much more subtle. So I can just kind of fine tune that if I feel it's necessary. I don't think in this case that it's necessary, so I'll just double click the slider handle to get it back to its default value. But what about vignetting? Do I want even more correction for the vignetting? In other words, do I want to kind of lighten up the edges of the photo a little bit? Or do I want to leave some of that darkening of the edges? And personally, I would like to leave some of that natural vignetting. Well, we have to think about, do we really want to introduce, you might say, or not remove vignetting in this context when I'm looking at the uncropped photo? <coughs> maybe, maybe not. If I want vignetting as a creative effect and I might crop the photo later, 
then I might want to neutralize the vignetting from the lens and apply my own creative vignetting later. I'll show you that approach and demonstrate why that's helpful in a moment. But in this case, I'm not going to crop the photo anyway. So it's not really an issue. I can adjust the degree of vignetting based on the lens correction any way I'd like. But again, if I'm happy with the result, I can leave it at that neutral value. And presumably, this will give me a result that has no visible vignetting at all. I'm going to tone it down a little bit, though. I like vignetting. But that leads us right into our next topic. Our next little tip for optimizing photos, crop almost always. Always, always, or almost always? Almost. Sometimes the framing just works. Why does the framing just work for this photo, in my opinion? Well, there's a bunch of reasons being, you know, the, the balance, yeah, subject over to the side, you know, the whole rule of thirds thing. There's all sorts of reasons, emphasizing the sky a little bit. There's reasons that you might like the framing. Why, in my mind, hopefully none of you can figure this out, but why, in my mind, does this framing work so well? That's good. That's a relief, actually. In my mind, this framing works well, really, because it's habit. How long have I been shooting at this exact aspect ratio? Nearly my whole life. So when I learned about composition, when I learned about subject placement within the frame, when I learned about balance within the frame and detail and you know, all these different things that I use to sort of adjust the perception of whatever it is I'm photographing, I was looking through a viewfinder that gave me that aspect ratio. So it's just inherent for me personally out of practice, years, decades even, of using this aspect ratio. It's not that there's anything necessarily magical about that aspect ratio. It's that it's what I'm accustomed to. And what I find is that very often, cropping a photo and being a little bit more creative about the cropping of the photo can have a dramatic impact. So there's a few things that we want to think about when we're cropping. And most of this is just attention to detail. But I will almost always at least explore cropping for a photo. What sorts of things am I looking at when I'm cropping a photo? Well, we talk about cropping, but really what goes hand in hand with cropping is rotation. And so when I'm cropping the photo, I'm also going to be thinking about rotation. I'm going to click on the crop tool. It's found just below the histogram display. I've got that hidden at the moment. But below the histogram display at the top of the right panel, we've got a little mini toolbar there. I'll click the crop tool, and you can see now I'm in the crop view. And I can adjust the rotation of the image. And there's a variety of ways I can do that. I've got an angle slider over here, so I can adjust the angle of the image. I can click on this little bubble level and drag across the horizon right there. No, not really. So I can click across and it'll rotate the image based on the line that I dragged, or I can just go hands-on, put my mouse outside the image, and click and drag. Notice I get that double-headed curved arrow, and I'm actually rotating the image itself. It's sort of like the crop box becomes my frame, and I'm rotating the print within the frame until I've got it just the way I want it. Which is the right approach? Don't know. Whatever works for you. I usually rotate manually like this unless I have a very clear horizon line that I want to make sure is perfectly straight. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. I can also move the image around. So I can just click and drag on the image to move the position of the image. And of course, I can adjust the size of the crop box. Notice that no matter which direction I drag my crop box, it's always sticking to that original aspect ratio, and that's because the aspect ratio is currently locked. Over here on the right side, you see a little lock icon. I am locked in to my original cropping, or my original aspect ratio. I could make this a square crop, for example, and now no matter how hard I drag the mouse in any direction, I cannot turn this into a rectangle. It will only be a square. But I can also turn on or I can turn off the lock, I can disable that lock, and now I can crop any way that I would like. I can tell everybody that I shot a panorama of the balloons, tell them it was like 16 shots done vertically, you know, or something. 
All right. So I've got more flexibility then in terms of how I'm defining that crop. Really, I was using a 600 millimeter lens. You know, I would never deceive the viewers of my images like that, obviously, right? But the point is that we, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, really, I wouldn't, except for you guys right here. Yeah. Um, so I'm able to define that crop. Now, my personal philosophy when it comes to cropping is that it's up to the image, basically, is the way I kind of look at that. And what I mean by that is that I'm not cropping based on the size of a frame that I bought at the frame shop, and I need to print an image that fits exactly into that 8 by 10 frame. I'm cropping based on the photo itself. And so I'm going to think about both rotation and cropping, try to make sure things are straight, that it looks natural, etc. I'm going to think about the edges first and foremost. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves is having a cropping that doesn't suit the image, that doesn't take into account distractions, which is the way I kind of look at it. Um, just subtle mistakes. Basically, I want everything about my photo to look intentional. I want everything that you like about my image to be something that you think I thought about and that was very intentional, very deliberate. What I want to avoid at all costs is something that looks like a mistake. So I don't want to have a balloon, in this case, that's just barely out of the frame. I either want it to be cut off in a kind of comfortable way, or I want it to be in the frame with a little bit of space at least around there. I don't want you to say, oh, you were so close to getting the whole balloon in the frame. Too bad you just barely missed it. <laughs> that's like the worst. And so I'm going to be very deliberate, and especially looking around all of the edges, and especially in the context of that rotation. So let's assume that I was rotating, trying to get the balloons to be vertical. Very important to note that uh, it was just a little bit of a breezy day, so some of the balloons were kind of tilted by the wind. It wasn't my camera that was crooked. <laughs> trying. Um, but if, we, if, you, if you believe that one, then maybe we'll... <laughs> Uh, but so let's assume that this is a good rotation, that you know, the balloons were a little crooked and I need to straighten things out, except now take a look at that bottom, kind of you know, the right third. Boy, that's close. And I need e either to have kind of a comfortable cropping of that subject or to have space around it. I want it in or out, basically. And not necessarily completely in. You know, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with some of the guidelines when it comes to photographing people. You don't cut people off at the knees or at the ankles. You, know, you don't make these awkward croppings of people. Same thing for all sorts of stuff out there. And so pay careful attention when you're cropping. And I'll oftentimes kind of play around with, well, okay, so that's too much, so maybe I need to bring it in. No, that's a little weird with just like the top half of the balloon in the frame. Eh, it's not quite right, so let's crop it out all together. Oh, great, now I got this other balloon that's kind of part. Maybe I am going with the panorama story after all. You know, so trying to make sure. And sometimes there's going to be some compromises. Sometimes you might resort to cleaning up elements in the frame that, you know, you can't quite get all the way in the frame, but you don't want just a little bit out of the frame, so you get rid of them all together. Uh, I'll leave that to, you know, you and whoever tells you what's okay to do to your pictures. Um, but the point is to be really critical. It's To me, cropping is one of the areas where the biggest or most obvious mistakes are made, or sort of the biggest omissions, you might say, are made, where I'll see li a little tiny branch just barely sticking into the frame, or you know, whatever random little blemish or distraction it might be. So taking a look at an example, uh, this is also the Palouse, um, of a horizon shot. So here we've got, it's real hazy, obviously, but you can see we've got a reasonably clear horizon back there. And this is where that angle tool works really nicely. And so I'll just grab that bubble level, little angle tool, and click and drag across the image. I recommend dragging a nice big long line so now you have a little bit more leeway. It's a little more comfortable uh, where a little bit of movement isn't going to make such a huge difference. So something like that. Click and drag across the line that should be perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical, as the case may be. And release. After you've clicked and dragged that line, the image gets rotated automatically. I have the lock unlocked for the aspect ratio, and so I can continue then to drag as I see fit. So maybe I want to tighten up on the background because it's kind of hazy and not so pretty back there anyway. And maybe I want to tighten up behind the subject, you know, kind of rule of third style or, you know, whatever it might be. 
but again, paying careful attention to exactly where you're cropping. And so in this case, what really bothers me is the bottom right. I'm going to click done here just so we can see the final cropped image, which will give us a little bit better sense here. Uh, a couple things along the bottom edge. Bottom center, this little speck of light, that bugs me. It might not bug you, and that's okay, but I would pay careful attention to these sorts of things. I might be tempted either to adjust my crop, so there's more or less of that light, depending on what's going to work for the image, or even to clean that up with some of the image cleanup tools. And then over here at the bottom right, this bothers me a little bit as well, because kind of an eye-catching. Anything that grabs your eye, but not in a good way, I probably want to fine-tune. And when it comes to cropping, what I'm really paying attention to first and foremost I would say are the edges of the image. So kind of going around all of the perimeter, the entire edge of that photo, and look, is there anything that just kind of, it's barely sticking in, or just a tiny bit of something is sticking out of the frame, or you know, whatever the case may be. So going back into the crop tool once again here. If I had the sail just barely out of the frame, or even right up against the edge of the frame, it just doesn't look right. Now if I crop it in even tighter, that would actually probably work okay, at least in terms of sail. It gets to be a little bit close for the, the glider here, the, the pilot. But the point is I don't want it to be right on the edge of something. I, usually, I want to give it a little bit of space, or I want to kind of make it a deliberate cropping of that subject. All right? And I really do pay attention. Like, I'd pay attention to this shadow line where it ends down here at the bottom left corner. I would look at individual trees along the edge. I know it seems a little bit silly, but paying careful attention to those details can really make a big difference in the final image. Um, you know, my buddy George Lepp used to always talk about how the difference between a pro photographer and an amateur photographer was the size of their trash can. <laughs> this was back in the days of slide film, so he was talking about throwing away a bunch of slides. And what he meant is that pro photographers, you see all these amazing great images, they just take a lot of pictures. So of course, at some point, you know, hopefully with all that practice, they're going to end up with some better pictures. Um, and I, today I would sort of change that because I think we're all taking countless pictures, at least I am. And so it really comes down to more of that attention to detail. So when it comes, cropping I think is one of the most important. Obviously there's other things we can do besides cropping to get rid of certain blemishes and whatnot. But I want to pay careful, careful attention and really scrutinize the image. Not just in cropping, but cropping certainly is one of the big ones that I see. All right. So go virtually black and white. I, you know, I'm a big fan of black and white imagery. I don't convert too many images to black and white. Um, I guess you could say I've kind of transitioned into color finally at some point. Um, and obviously a lot, I'm sure for many of you, same sort of thing. I love black and white photography in part because that's where I got my start in the wet dark room, sliding the piece of paper into the developer solution and seeing that latent image magically show up. There's just nothing like it. Uh, but I still like to convert some of my color photos to black and white. Um, and for that, I usually go virtual. Now, I mean this in a couple of ways, actually. Lightroom is always non-destructive when it comes to adjusting your images. And what that means is we're not adjusting your original raw captures or whatever other file types we might be talking about. We're not adjusting the actual pixels in the actual file on your hard drive inside of Lightroom. You can think of Lightroom as being like one big adjustment layer, if you're familiar with that concept in Photoshop. It's all non-destructive. It's just metadata. It's just information. So in the develop module, sometimes you notice it might take a little bit of time sometimes for the preview to update, because Lightroom has to say, oh, you want to make that change? OK, hold on. I've got to go look at the raw capture, and then I've got to do the math to apply that change to that raw capture data. It can take a little bit of effort. And so if you don't have a fast computer, maybe it's going to take a little bit of extra time in some cases. So, but it's always non-destructive. You don't have to worry about your original raw captures. All right. But also, we have the ability to work virtually. And what I mean by that is virtual copies. So this image, I think, is perfectly fine in color. And so I might go through my basic adjustments for the color image. Maybe I'll add a little drama by darkening up the shadows. And I'll bring in a little bit of extra highlight detail. And of course, we need some clarity, because every picture gets clarity and some vibrance to boost those colors, and you know, maybe crop and rotate just a hair, and you know, whatever needs to be done to the image. But the textures here are kind of cool. It might be fun in black and white. And you don't know until you give it a try, so let's give it a try. <laughs> but there's the rub. What if you don't know? 
Now sometimes you're just, oh, this picture needs to be black and white. From the moment I clicked the shutter release, I knew this was gonna be a black and white photo. Great, dive right in. But if you're not sure, we can have two versions of the photo. And so this is kind of two tips in one, uh, both in terms of working with black and white in Lightroom, but also working with virtual copies. So remember that when we're working in Lightroom, it's non-destructive. All of our adjustments are really just metadata values about our original raw capture. Well, why not have two sets of data? One for the color image, one for the black and white. Or three sets of data, another one for sepia tone. Or, you get the idea. So the way we do that is to create a virtual copy. So I'll right click on the image, in this case just down on the film strip, I'll choose create virtual copy, and you will see that I now have two copies of my image. If I mouse over, it's probably a little small for you to see there, but below the image in this black bar area, you can see that there when I hover over this image with the mouse, you see the .cr2, that raw capture. And when I mouse over the other version of the image, you see that it has copy one appended to it, meaning this is a virtual copy. We also have a little upturned page, you know, the corner of the page is dog-eared to indicate that this is a virtual copy. You can also see the indication that the two images are stacked together, image one of two and two of two, for example. But the point is that this is a second copy of my photo without being a second copy of my photo. It's just a second copy of my adjustments. So I haven't made another copy of my original raw capture, I just have another set of adjustments. It takes almost no space on the hard drive. Not literally none, but not very much space at all. And all this information by default anyhow is stored within the Lightroom catalog in any event, so really it's just affecting the size of your catalog. So then we can say, okay, I'm working on my virtual copy. Let's take a look at black and white. Let's see what might work as a black and white interpretation of this photo, whether or not I like it. You can see that up here under basic, there's a treatment option, color versus black and white. That's one way to get started with our black and white adjustments. I could just click black and white right there, but instead I'm going to scroll down and remember our friend HSL color. Well, we also have B and W for black and white. I'll go ahead and click that. And now we've simplified that set of sliders. Instead of sliders for hue and saturation and luminance, for all of our individual colors. We actually have individual sliders for those colors, and it's just our black and white mix. This, to me, is wonderful, because now we can adjust the luminance for specific areas, but the buildup for that bad joke was intended to get us to this little tiny target thing here. So you see up in the top left corner where we have the black and white mix sliders, we've got this little target, this little button, for this, what I refer to as the on image adjustment. I'm gonna click on that to activate it. And it'll be a little hard to see because the mouse pointer gets a little bit small in this case. But I'm gonna come out over the image. In fact, let's see, where is it easier to see? Over here in the shadows. I'm gonna put it right in there just so you can see it for a moment. That becomes kind of a handle or, or a finger to point at the image and say, Lightroom, here's what I want you to do. Or this is the area I want you to affect. Basically what I'm saying is Lightroom, I don't remember what color the boat is. Thankfully, I've got a bunch of people here to help me out. But if I were at home with nobody to help me, then I would need you to help me. And what I'm saying is, Lightroom, I don't remember what color this is, but can you help me out? Now, when I mouse over the boat, so it might be a little bit difficult to see the mouse pointer there, it's kind of small. But when I mouse over the boat, if you take a look over at my set of sliders, notice that blue is highlighted, including both the numeric value kind of gets a lighter box around it, and blue is now white instead of gray. That's telling me that that's the slider I need to touch, that I need to adjust in order to adjust that area of the photo. In other words, if I drag the blue slider to the right, the blues get brighter. If I drag it to the left, the blues get darker. The thing is, I'm way too lazy to go all the way back over there and grab the slider. I just want to stay right here and tell Lightroom what to do. And they don't have voice recognition yet. So instead, what I'm going to do is click on the image. Remember, I clicked on what we think might be a blue area. We clicked on the boat, it's a blue area, and so now if I drag upward, I'll be brightening the blues, and if I drag downward, I'll be darkening the blues. So I can not even have to worry about what color stuff is in the image. Now I realize that this is wildly hilarious in the context of not remembering whether the, blue, the boat was blue or not. And that, you know, you're gonna go home like, oh, Tim was so funny. <laughs> You can tweet that on the Twitters. 
But actually, there are times where this is really helpful beyond just working on the image, which is helpful in its own right. And I don't mean literally not remembering what color something was, but a better example would be those bricks. What color were they? Oh, that's easy, red. Except remember the red didn't have that strong an impact on the luminosity values in the image. Actually, orange worked better. And you'll find very often for foliage, yellows have a very strong impact, whereas greens have a very minimal impact. And so as much as, you know, I like to joke about these things because I have nothing better to do to entertain myself up here, it's also really helpful in the context of, I, I don't know if it's going to consider that yellow versus green or red versus orange and orange versus yellow. I just know that that's the general area or that's the general color value that I want to adjust. So I don't remember what this was over here. I can see now that I'm moving my mouse over it that that area is considered yellow. And as I drag up, versus down, I'm lightening and darkening the yellows as well as having a lesser effect on the orange. You can see both the yellows and oranges moving in this case. Uh, we can go, there's probably not that much else in the way of colors in this photo. Uh, we got a little bit of greenish, yeah, that's blue. Mousing around here, there's some aqua, you know, so not much in the way of variations in colors. It's mostly a blue boat and the red to orange brick wall and the reflections of all that stuff. But the point is that yeah, sometimes you're going to forget the color of the boat, and you're going to forget that you got the color version of the image down there, and you might not have an audience of people to help you remember what color the boat was, but you're also going to run into a situation maybe where there's some subtlety, where it could be one or the other, they're all sort of in a, a big range, and just clicking in the image and dragging up or down to brighten or darken, then you don't have to think so much about what color was stuff originally, and more importantly, is that you're just kind of focused on the image. And isn't that where you want to be focusing your attention in any event? It is for me. All right. But thank you so much for your willingness <laughs> to remind me what color the boat was. All right. Number nine, clean up and more in Photoshop. Now, I don't want to disparage Lightroom in any way and suggest that you can't perform image cleanup work in Lightroom. You certainly can. It's just that Photoshop has some more powerful tools for image cleanup, and more importantly, perhaps, Photoshop has some very powerful tools for all sorts of other things. We'll take a look at a couple of examples, but first, I actually want to show you that Lightroom actually does a pretty good job of cleaning up little dust spots and blemishes and, you know, various issues within the photo. First, I, you know, I should know better than to make another effort at humor after <laughs> what just happened a few moments ago, but I was going to point out, I will do it with a non-humorous voice this time, how hard I had to dig and search and search and search and search. I've spent the last three weeks searching for an image that contained dust spots so that I could demonstrate to you how to clean up dust spots, and I could not find them. Every, they're all impeccably clean. It was kind of frustrating, i got to admit. Fortunately, after weeks of searching, I found one. <laughs> How many spots do you see? Number one, that's not polite. Lots. And number two, it's not that many. Six or seven. That's, that seems reasonable. <laughs> Six or seven, and, you know, they're all up here. One, two, three, four, this little line of a one, maybe it's a little hair or something, I don't know. Yeah, that's six or seven. I'm gonna click the spot healing, uh, the, sorry, the spot healing, it's like I'm in Photoshop. The spot removal tool, and then we can get rid of them. So, see that little spot right there? It's gonna click, and it magically disappears. That's awesome. Taking a look at the settings over here, I've got the spot edit set to heal rather than clone, and I would say that always I want it on heal. Maybe there's an exception, you know, in random little moments, but pretty much I always want it on heal, which causes the pixels that are copied from one area to another to cover up a blemish will blend into the surrounding area. So it works out very nicely. Uh, but more importantly, now of course I could zoom in to get a closer look at all these dust blemishes, but first I want to show you visualize spot. How many did you say there were? Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, plus the one I deleted, fifteen. Can't see the ones in the what? Can't see the ones in the what? Thank goodness for that. Yeah. 
you cannot see the ones in the water. Now we also have this little slider, and this is kind of this, you know, wild embossed kind of a, a wait, maybe I shouldn't have done that because now there's <laughs> even more. We got to start over with our count. There are a lot of them here. You see the outline of the rock in the background starting to pick up through the fog, but all of these little blemishes, these little spots, uh, probably, I'm guessing, water droplets, little water spots that accumulated when um, probably somebody else, I let them borrow my camera and they changed lenses <laughs> without my permission <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but I can actually, with this visualize spots option enabled, I can actually click in the image. So click to get rid of that dust spot. You'll notice that with my mouse over the image, you're seeing the little buttons that indicate the source and destination. So it's kind of going to look for the moment like there are still a bunch of spots out there. What I'll do in a moment here after I click on, oh, maybe, you know, half dozen or so of these is move my mouse out away from the image. And that's because I have my tool overlay option here down at the bottom of the toolbar, far left of the toolbar, set to <coughs> auto as opposed to always or never, etc. I like auto because then when I move out over the image with my mouse, I can see the spots where I've cleaned up, etc. And then when I move my mouse off the image, those spots go away and I can see just the image itself. So in this way, I can adjust the size as needed with the left and right square bracket keys. So left square bracket key will make that spot removal a little larger. The right square bracket key will make it a little larger. Did I say larger for both? Left square bracket will make it smaller. Right square bracket will make it bigger. Nice little keyboard shortcut. You do also have a size slider over there on the right panel here in the develop module. So obviously I could continue clicking and clicking and clicking on what turned out to be way more dust spots than I had counted on. Or again, I think these are really just uh, water droplets. But I can also click and drag. So I'm going to turn off the visualize spots just because that'll make it a little bit easier. And I'm going to zoom in so that we can see this a little bit better. And Go find, there it is, that little, I don't know what that is, like some sort of little piece of fuzz or, it's a, it's a spot that moved or something. Um, but anyhow, we've got this little area. Well, I could make a really big brush, except I don't want to clean up areas that I don't have to. Well, I'm not limited to just circles. I mean, the brush is a circle, but I can use a smaller brush and then click and drag. So instead of just clicking to add a spot to clean up, I can click and drag to paint over the area that I need to clean up. And then when I release, you see that clean up. The source and destination, of course, will be the exact same shape. Notice that Lightroom has tried to find a good source. I could change it. I'll bring it down into the water just to, you know, be silly. Um, so now we've got a little bit of water texture up in the sky. But if Lightroom, for some reason, every now and then you'll see that it'll, it'll come up with some weird analysis of the photo and decide, oh, we need some water up here. Um, and so then you can just click and drag that source into a different position. Just make sure not to put it into a position where there's another dust spot, because then you're just duplicating that spot. Uh, but again, notice because of that heal option that we get a pretty good healing, a pretty good blending in the air. It looks like I needed it to be a little bit larger over here, but I could just paint another little area as well to clean up that spot, etc. But you get the idea there. So Lightroom actually gives us some pretty good capabilities. Boy, we got to straighten the horizon on this one also. This image is just a mess. Probably should just delete it. Uh, but we've got some basic capabilities in terms of image cleanup in Lightroom. And again, that visualize spots option to me is just fantastic. And do make sure to dr drag that slider. Don't just assume that because you've got really good contrast at one position that you shouldn't drag through different values just to make sure. Usually I find that the higher the value, the easier it is to see spots. Um, but that's mostly just because those spots are going to be visible in the brighter areas of the photo. So you know, kind of don't take it for granted um, that whatever the value is set to by default or whatever you left it at last time is going to be a good value. Kind of drag through and check for those spots in the photo. But what about when you've got a situation where Lightroom is just not doing a very good job? Um, you need a little bit more sophisticated work. That to me is when Photoshop comes into play. Um, now this image obviously there's no dust spots, you know, more typical scenario. <laughs> However, wide angle lens. Oh, man. The problem with the wide angle lens is that it's wide. And the problem with being a photographer is you kind of have this natural inclination to put the sun behind you. 
and then sometimes the wide angle lens and the sun behind you, you end up with the shadow of your head in the frame, as you can see right down here at the bottom center. Now, if I hadn't pointed that out to you, would you have noticed? Good. Okay, cool. <laughs> Note to self, I don't have to clean up everything. Uh, but, you know, in a case like this, could Lightroom accomplish that cleanup work? No. Nah, nah, I mean, could it? It's possible. In this case, you'd have to use the clone option rather than the heal option because the healing is going to cause this blending of those pixels, which is going to cause kind of a ghosting effect in the grass. But you know what, honestly, I would just prefer to take it to Photoshop once I've gotten to that point in the image. And there's a bunch of other stuff that I might want to do in Photoshop. You've probably noticed, if you've been using Lightroom for a while, with each new release of Lightroom, there's more and more and more that we can do in Lightroom. And so there's less and less and less that we need to send an image out to Photoshop for. But there still are a few things. Uh, creating composite images, for example. Uh, and for me, well, actually, we're going to create a composite in this case, you might say. Um, but also for some image cleanup. And most of it just comes down to there's some more powerful tools in Photoshop, plus I've been using Photoshop a lot longer than I've been using Lightroom. It feels just like second nature. I, you know, not that Lightroom is difficult by any stretch, but Lightroom has been around, what, anybody know? Six, seven, eight years, something like that? I don't remember. And Photoshop's been around, it's probably going on about 25 years now, give or take. I'm not old enough to have been using Photoshop since day one, but... So I've selected an image that I would like to send to Photoshop. Thank you for not laughing too loudly at that one, by the way. Uh, and then I'm going to go to the Photo menu and choose Edit In. And then, in this case, I want to use Photoshop. So I'll choose Photoshop. You can see I've got Photoshop Elements installed. I have a variety of plugins. I can send this image to all sorts of different software that kind of plugs in, you might say, to Lightroom. So I'll go ahead and choose Photoshop. Photoshop was not already running, so Photoshop will launch, providing me with an opportunity for a quick sip of coffee. And then the image will be opened. And I'll just do a real kind of quick correction in this case. I'm going to make a selection. I'll just use the lasso tool here. And I'm going to make a selection. This is not intended, by the way, to teach you everything you need to know about layer masking. This is just a little quick overview. But I'm going to make a selection that's bigger than the object I need to clean up. And then I'm going to move it somewhere else. And because I'm set to the Create New Selection option, up at the far left of the Options bar, we have New Selection, Add to Selection, Subtract from Selection, and Intersect with Selection. Because I'm set to the New Selection option, it means if I were to start clicking and dragging through the image somewhere else, I would get rid of this selection and create a brand new selection. But if I point my mouse inside the selection, I can now click and drag and move the selection. I'm going to move it over to here, because I think somewhere over in here, is probably a good source of pixels to get rid of the shadow of my head. At least, I hope so. So I have my background image layer selected on the Layers panel. It's actually the only layer that's available at the moment because I haven't done anything in Photoshop just yet. And so then I'll go up onto the menu bar and choose Layer, New, Layer via Copy. You can also press Control-J on Windows or Command-J on Macintosh to accomplish the same thing. That will copy the current layer to a new layer, except because I have a selection active, only the selected pixels will be copied to that new layer. It's called layer one. I'm going to call this shadow fix. So I'll just double click on the name, type a new name, press enter or return. And now I have a shadow fix layer. I'm going to turn off my background image layer just so you can see. There is my shadow fix layer. It's not fixing the shadow yet, but it is poised and ready. I'll grab my Move tool. Letter V on the keyboard is the shortcut key for the Move tool. Here is my Shadow Fixer. I can move it around into the right position within the photo. Let's call it, oh, right there. Yes, I know I got these up here that I need to clean up. but We're not going to worry about that right now. <laughs> I'm then going to add a layer mask. So I'll click on the circle inside of a square icon down at the bottom of the Layers panel. That'll add a layer mask to my shadow fix layer. And then, if you notice, the edge of my shadow fix layer has a crisp edge. I'll <laughs> zoom in just a little bit so we can get a better sense of that. We've got this crisp edge because I made a very crisp selection. 
Well, if I just grab my brush tool and set my foreground color to black, letter D on the keyboard will give you the default colors of white and black in the case of a layer mask. You can press the letter X to invert those or exchange foreground and background. I'll make sure that I'm using a soft edge brush. I've got the hardness set down to 0% using the control up here on the options bar. I'll make the brush a little bit bigger, and then I'll just click and drag. I'm actually painting on the layer mask in black, and on a layer mask, black blocks and white reveals, and that gives me a nice blending. Well, is it the right blending? I don't know, because we got rid of the rest of the image. I'll go ahead and turn on the visibility of the background image layer. That looks pretty good. I can kind of clean up and kind of bob and weave around the blades of grass and try and, you know, make sure that I'm not creating any kind of weirdness. Thank goodness that grass kind of has a chaos all its own, so it hides, you know, little mistakes here and there and whatnot. But in any event, obviously I could spend some more time trying to get that absolutely perfect, and obviously I just re-revealed part of the shadow, so we'll do something like that, etc. But you get the idea, kind of a quick and dirty, quick and dirty job there, but it gives you the concept, and that's something that simply would be impossible to do in this way within Lightroom, not with the degree of control that we have in Photoshop. Could you possibly get a really good result with the clone feature with that spot removal brush? Quite possibly. It might take a little more work. Um, and frankly, I'm just a little bit more comfortable with some of this layer-based stuff working in Photoshop. And it's not intended to say that this is something that you absolutely could only accomplish in Photoshop, but rather it's an example of one of the things that you might want to do in Photoshop. And it's pretty straightforward to send an image from Lightroom over to Photoshop. So how do we get it back? Very simple. Do not try to overcomplicate this. It's save and close. That's all. Not save as. Not, I'd like to give this a completely different file name just for fun, or save it on a different hard drive, because why not? Why? You're going to confuse Lightroom. So just save. So you can go to the file menu and choose file save, or you can just press control S on Windows, command S on Macintosh, save that image, and then once it's finished saving, we can close that image, so we can choose File Close or Keyboard Shortcut, Control W, Command W. And then we go right back into Lightroom, and as if by magic, look at that. So here's our original raw capture, and here's the PSD file. In your preferences, you can choose whether you want Lightroom to make a TIFF file versus a PSD file when you send it over to Photoshop. So that is an option you can establish. So, with the shadow, without the shadow. I mean, really, with the shadow, it makes it feel more personal, doesn't it? <laughs> I, that's what I was going for artistically. I don't know if it quite worked. Thank you for not laughing too loud. All right, finally, get targeted. Now, this takes on a few different things. And I, I'm not going to go really super in-depth. My point here is really just to emphasize that these capabilities exist and to encourage you to explore those capabilities. And so just looking at a couple of quick examples, real common situation, graduated split neutral density filter type of effect, except for the part. Well, it's a little brief side story. I was going to get rich, and then it didn't happen. Um, I was going to sell a series of graduated split neutral density filters and so there would be like the Monument Valley set, you know, with <laughs> shapes of buttes. Instead of just a gradient, it would actually have outlines. So you would just line up. And the beauty of it was that it would be great because you didn't have, you know, the butte getting darker toward the top or, you know, the building getting tall, uh, darker toward the top or the tree or whatever, the thing that stuck into the frame that would always bother you when you're using a graduated filter. Plus, you'd have to buy like so many of these. We'd have like the Natural Landscapes collection and the City Skylines collection. I mean, you'd be buying hundreds of filters, each of you. And pretty soon we're talking real money. Um, but unfortunately, digital came along, so I had to change course and start teaching Photoshop and Lightroom. <laughs> but there is still value in the graduated filter. Uh, you can see it kind of looks like a graduated neutral density filter. <laughs> on that same little toolbar where we picked the crop tool, for example. And my typical approach here is to just start off with an exaggerated adjustment, just because it makes it a little easier for me to see exactly what's going on. There's a couple of ways you could approach this, but I just make an exaggerated adjustment. Notice that we only have a subset of our adjustments. We don't have the entire develop module available to apply in a gradient fashion. 
but we have kind of, I would say, the most important adjustments here. In this case, I've just cranked down the exposure, and now I'm just going to click and drag in the image, and the direction that I drag determines the direction that the gradient transitions across, and then the distance, of course, that I drag determines the, the distance of transition. You might call it the size of that gradient effect. I can also grab that button in the middle and drag it up or down as I see fit. I can point to the center line and click and drag to rotate if I need to apply a correction there. I can grab the top or bottom line if I need to make it a shorter transition or a longer transition. So let's just assume that that's a good transition in this case, avoiding the awkward issue of darkening the top of the butte kind of a thing, right? Um, which is the real problem with the neutral density filter, graduated neutral density filter. Uh, but then I can fine tune, so you know, maybe darken up the sky versus you know, enhancing contrast in the sky, maybe darkening down the highlights in the sky. Of course, we're going to increase saturation in the sky, <laughs> uh, increase clarity, whatever the case may be. The point is I have these variety of adjustments available that are applying in a gradient effect. And I can still go back and forth. I can say, well, I sure love the effect that I've just applied to the sky but I want it to come down a little bit further, or I want it to transition over a longer distance, you know, whatever the case may be. Point being is that we have that capability. Uh, we also, we have the same basic capability. I'm gonna go ahead and just reset that adjustment for a quick moment. We have the same basic concept in an elliptical shape. So it's exactly the same thing. You can see we kind of have the same gradient. It's just instead of a linear gradient, you might think of this as an elliptical gradient. I basically think of this as the vignette tool with a lot more flexibility. So not only can we adjust the exposure to kind of create a vignette type of effect, but we could also you know, increase contrast or decrease contrast out toward those edges, or maybe taper off the saturation out toward those edges. And of course, I can adjust the feather. So I'm gonna reduce saturation just because that's kind of a dramatic effect. And then I'll reduce the feathering versus increase the feathering. So, you know, all sorts of potential possibilities. I would say by and large, with this radial effect, we're really probably going for more of a traditional um, gradient, but, or I'm sorry, for a traditional vignette, but you do have more flexibility than that. But more importantly, perhaps, is that we can exercise even greater control with the adjustment brush. Now with the adjustment brush, we're able to paint a specific adjustment into a specific area of the photo. It's amazing. So what I wanna do is make the image black and white except for the car. This is pretty easy, except I gotta paint very carefully along this edge around the car. My basic guideline here is you gotta be careful for the border of the area, and then we can not be so careful after that. Uh, we'll go ahead and start off once again with that real drastic exposure adjustment, just so that I can see what I'm doing, and then I'll come back and fine tune things. Um, but you're going to need to be really quiet. I'm going to reduce the feathering here a little bit. And I think that size will be okay. Uh, so you should be able to see the effect while I'm painting. But uh, this requires a tremendous amount of concentration. So you're going to have to be really quiet as I paint along the edge, trying to define very perfectly exactly the transition between the car and the rest of the picture. I appreciate the, whoa! <laughs> Somebody thought about saying something. Okay, I'm gonna undo. We'll try this again. This time I'm gonna turn on the auto mask button because then I don't have to hardly think at all. Oops, except <laughs> then I mess it up again. The joke doesn't work as well when you spoil it. So auto mask turned on, look at that, look. Now all I have to do, it's actually a little more difficult than it looks. I'm gonna make this brush bigger to make it easier on myself. All I have to do is keep the crosshair. See the little plus symbol, the crosshair inside my brush? I just have to keep that outside the car and I need to keep the border between the outside of the car and the car in other words, the edge of the car, I need to keep that inside the car. So notice how my circle overlaps with the edge of the car, but I'm keeping the crosshair outside the car, and it's automatically defining the car 
you didn't have to be quiet at all. See how that was funny now in retrospect? Yes, we all do. Now, notice a couple of things. Number one, that really was most effective for the edge of the car because there was a clear boundary there. But it didn't quite get everything. Notice, you can see a few areas where the stripes on the road didn't quite get picked up properly. So for that, I need to turn off auto mask and I'll reduce my brush size and, uh, more and come into these areas. This one I think is okay. Yep, that's good. And I'll paint over this little area, etc. Being careful not to paint over the car, obviously. But now that I've got that sort of boundary area defined, now it's, it really starts to get easy. Again, auto mask is turned off at this point. And now just using a large brush, come out over here. Oops, let me get a little smaller in here just so I don't mess up where the stripe is. And then I can make it bigger. And eventually I can be using a big, huge brush. So now I've got that area really well defined, and I'll just come in here and finish up the effect. Now, what I'm realizing now, the, what's the huge mistake that I made? Well, I should have said I just wanted to change the car instead of everything else, because that would have been so much easier. Yes, it would have. All right, but that's the extra mile I go for you guys, because you're so great. Remember the blue boat thing? That was really helpful. And so. So now, presumably, I've defined the area that I want to adjust. I can reset that exposure adjustment because I really didn't want to change the exposure. What I wanted to do, perhaps, was make the background, you know, most of the photo black and white with a red car driving through a black and white scene, for example. Or, I mean, of course, everything wants clarity, so let's add some more clarity back there, you know, whatever the case may be. But point being is with that adjustment brush now, I can really focus adjustments on specific areas. With auto mask, I'm able to real clearly define objects that have some clear definition to them. And then for more nebulous stuff, then I can just use a relatively soft edge brush and paint directly anywhere in the image. So I'll go ahead, and as much as I hate to undo all that hard work, I'm going to, uh, actually we'll just reset this adjustment brush. If I, let's say I just wanted to make the sky black and white, ignoring this power pole that goes up into the sky. Because I have a slightly kind of fuzzy edge, if I reduce my value for feather, and just kind of paint across this line. Right now I'm reducing exposure, obviously, and I'm not very good at following the lines. Um, but you know, if you kind of use a lot of imagination right now, um, you can imagine that I was following right along that line really well. You can see how difficult it can be, or how bad I really am at it. Uh, but the point is that we could, in some cases, we don't have to worry so much about defining a perfect line, and we'll illustrate that point in just a moment here. Now we got that sky defined. Not very well, I might add. Reset my exposure adjustment. What if I just wanted to crank up the clarity to really get those sky, the clouds in the sky to pop? Well, now is it so important that I was painting perfectly along the horizon? No, not really. Um, I was doing a really bad job because you guys are making me <laughs> nervous. But the point is that if we're having a relatively subtle effect on a targeted area of the photo, and there's a relatively gradual transition from one area to the next, and the horizon very often is, because there'll be a little bit of haze at the horizon, for example. Under those circumstances, relatively gradual transition and a relatively modest adjustment, you don't need that precision that comes with auto mask, for example. You can even use a feathered brush, increase the value for feather a little bit, and just paint the effect into various areas of the photo. So don't think that you always have to be painstakingly careful in the areas that you're painting, sometimes it's not really getting away with anything. You just don't need the degree of precision if you're using a relatively modest adjustment. Even the people outside are clapping already. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Now, how many tips could I have come up with for optimizing your photos in Lightroom? Probably a thousand, but then we'd be here all week. Not that that's necessarily a bad idea. Um, but in any event, I hope that all proves very helpful for you guys. Thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.